Today I'm going to ask a fairly poignant question, and that's, you know, are we doing the right thing? Are we pursuing the right goal? And I'm not talking about whether we should decarbonize or not. You know, that's, that is now the law of the land. Uh, what I'm asking is, if we're going to do this, is cost-effective, modest decarbonization the right goal on the way to deep decarbonization? So I'm going to show you some modeling today, and basically that modeling, it is ideal. But if you assume wind and solar costs less than the dispatchable low-carbon technologies, and I'm I'm naming CCUS and nuclear as those technologies. So if you make that assumption, which is what most people are saying, you could defend California's renewable portfolio standard under ideal model, and that is 50% uh, renewable energy. Uh, but my question today is, you know, when Californians wake up in 2030 and they have all this renewable energy and they realize the goal was not to maximize renewable energy, the goal was to minimize carbon emissions, are they going to feel good about themselves? Are they going to feel good about the foundation they've set for the future once they need to do 30, 40, 50 percent more decarbonization after that? And the answer is no. And the reason is this. Deep decarbonization is a completely different animal than modest decarbonization. I think Deck uh, mentioned earlier uh, talking about uh, renewable energy and natural gas. Well, natural gas is the crutch for renewable energy. The problem with renewable energy is that if it is on, something else is off. And that means you know, something else is going to have a low utilization problem. And if that's natural gas, that's fine. Or not fine, but it won't kill the cost of the system. Because natural gas capital costs are around $1,000. They have the lowest maintenance costs. But once we go towards deep decarbonization, everything on the grid is capital intense. The marginal costs become lower. Everything is capital intense. And so we're talking about offsetting something that might have a capital cost as high as $5,000 per kilowatt, and probably three times the maintenance costs. That becomes very expensive. So what people say is, you know, this isn't really a problem because we're going to have demand response, we're going to have storage, and that's going to solve all these intermittency issues. Everybody knows that there, there's a timing problem with renewable energy, but what people don't appreciate is the time scale involved in that timing problem. You know, renewable energy varies on seconds, minutes, hours, there are diurnal cycles, but the seasonal cycles are the ones that you can't get rid of with interconnection towards other regions, and the seasonal cycles are the ones that storage can't solve, or demand response for that matter. So I'm going to go over that today. I'm going to model some storage. And then uh, under the same assumptions, the same exact assumptions that I used to defend, uh, modest decarbonization with just renewables, under those same assumptions, the priority will be switched towards the dispatchable low carbon generators. And I'm just going to call this DLC from now on, or dispatchable low carbon. And it will, it will actually be the opposite of the LCOE. So this is how people are thinking of, this is, this is our economic metric for electricity, for better or worse. It's, it's the simplest one. It's the, people, it's the one people use, levelized cost of electricity. Now on the x-axis here, now this is not good, you cannot see the axis. All right, well, I'll have to uh, just tell you what it is the rest of the day. Sorry about that. So on the x-axis here is the capacity factor assumed, and on the y-axis is the delivered cost of energy. So uh, solar would have, I'm assuming, the lowest capital cost. I haven't seen any capital cost this low, but let's just assume it gets all the way down to 1,400 and a 25% capacity factor. So I'm giving renewables the benefit of the doubt because uh, 25 percent capacity factor is basically assuming single axis tracking. Fixed axis tracking is near 20. Residential systems are even worse. So let's assume $90 for wind, $80, or $90 for solar, $80 for wind has a higher, slightly higher capacity factor, so that kind of makes up for the fact that it has a higher capital cost. And then dispatchable low carbon is way over here with a 90 percent capacity factor and a capital cost of $5,400 per kilowatt. And these are just assumptions that I'm using to make a point here. I'm not saying these are what the costs are. And so the problem with renewable energy, and, and Holly actually pointed this out last night, you know, she's not in the renewables industry, but it's, it's intuitive. They all come on at the same time, and they cause a low utilization problem for themselves. So if we had um, a grid that was 80% renewable energy, this would be the utilization of the last generators added to the system. And then the delivered costs would be as, as high as you know, 160. And basically people are saying, you know, you know the market will take care of this. Once once the marginal developer adds to the grid, he'll see that, you know, I'm not going to be able to recoup the cost of all my megawatt hours because the market clearing price is zero because the marginal cost on the margin is renewables, and so I'll stop building. And then people are saying, okay, well, once that happens, the dispatchable low carbon generator will look much better. But at that point, you've already taken up all the spring megawatt hours, basically, on a seasonal basis. So, at that point, the dispatchable low carbon generator has now absorbed that low utilization problem I talked about at the beginning. And so now it becomes much more expensive to do deep decarbonization. And so that's why I'm going to basically tell you today that if we go down a renewables only road, it's a dead end. 
So here's just a grab bag of, of, um, of, of, of complaints, I guess, perception versus reality, uh, and how this would relate to the coal industry. So first of all, you know, most people think decarbonization only, only involves renewable energy. And then, so if somebody came up to me and said, I'm only for renewables, well, I would, my reaction would basically be, okay, I can see you're not really serious about deep decarbonization. If you were about deep decarbonization, you'd be about diversity, and that includes fossil fuels, uh, coal, natural gas, is CCUS, and uranium, I'm considering that a fossil fuel, and then renewable energy, but also storage. I'll, I'll show you how storage has a role, whether we use uh, intermittent generators or not. Secondly, uh, so I've already said this, fossil fuels are carbon emitting. You know, when you're on Meet the Press, people just say fossil fuels. They don't ever say fossil fuels that are carbon emitting. So someone needs to be proud of CCUS, so somebody actually knows that uh, fossil fuels can be low carbon. But secondly, this point here, many researchers I look up to have this opinion that CCUS e with EOR is bad for the planet. So first of all, on a technical basis, we do life cycle assessment, we do accounting for emissions based on where the fossil fuel is combusted, not where it is supplied. So on a technical basis, there is no contest. But I didn't come here to uh, quibble on a technical basis and win on a technical basis. I came here to talk seriously about deep decarbonization. So why would I advocate for EOR if deep decarbon, or you know, why would I advocate for an increase in the supply of oil if I'm for deep decarbonization? Well, basically, I think what they were thinking, and I'm, this is kind of a straw man, but I think what they were thinking was that oil would be $100 per barrel, and then if we flooded the market with EOR, that would drive down the cost towards $50 a barrel. But that's already happened with a more polluting source, unconventional oil. And so you know, I think it's quite clear that we're going to hit peak demand for oil rather than hit peak supply. You know, basically, that old saying, we didn't, run out, we didn't end the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. And so while they think it makes all the difference in the world in the price of oil, I think it makes all the difference in the world as to whether we're actually going to uh, sequester the emissions from the manufacturing industry, or whether we're ever going to uh, sequester emissions from the atmosphere. You know, if we, if we don't master it when 15% of the flue gas is CO2, we're never going to do it when it's 500 parts per million. So, and the last thing here, and this is basically the theme of the presentation. I talked to you about shifting the legalization problem on the natural gas and then dispatch below low carbon. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about storage. But the other ideas that people have are you know, the other baseload things that we need, like zero carbon liquid fuels. They're saying renewable energy, um, the problem is going to be solved by different loads in the future. Well, first of all, if we do direct air capture or zero carbon liquid fuels, those are really expensive. Um, those are very expensive processes. And we are not going to help those processes by only allowing them to run seasonally. And secondly, uh, VMT stands for vehicle miles traveled. I didn't model uh, storage through transportation, but the vehicle miles traveled don't, don't correlate with the oversupply of renewable energy. The oversupply of renewable energy happens in the spring. The driving season is in the late summer, and it's during the holiday season. So it's not necessarily going to make the problem better. It might actually make the problem worse, but it's very complicated. Uh, to model that, and I don't think it is really worth modeling it, to be frank with you, because I think by the time probably 2030 rolls around, the focus is going to be on self-driving cars. So finally, okay, wow. Um, the, other, the other perception is there that market-based mechanisms can solve climate, and this, this kind of drives me crazy uh, when I hear people talking about, you know, we need to set the right price signals. Well, with carbon, there's no such thing as a right price signal. You know, I could give you a perfect forecast for the weather between now and the end of time, and we still don't have the social science tools to quantify those damages because it's all dependent on the discount rate and it's all dependent on the level of risk aversion. That's not science. Those are your feelings. So there, the social cost of carbon is not quantifiable, and basically what I'm telling you today is if we minimize carbon emissions around a modest amount, that's essentially the same thing as a low carbon price. Basically what I'm telling you today is that's the wrong road. Secondly. So what this says is capacity markets are still not mature. So I guess I'll just go to the next slide since I didn't even make it. So we need long-term thinking for a long-term problem. And I don't think markets have, have solved, I mean, I'm not saying markets don't have a place. They have a place for shorter-term problems, not longer-term problems. And you know, this is the history of capacity in the electricity industry. And before 2000, it was, it, it was known as the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. And so we basically need to repeat greatness. And what we have going on right now is we had restructuring, we had this explosion of natural gas generators coming on the grid, and then we had a recession. 
And so we had all this excess capacity, and we still haven't proven what a pragmatic capacity mechanism is. Studying capacity markets is, by the way, why I'm here. This is why I, I became, became skeptical of renewables as the solution. So as we look into the future, and we don't know the cost, we don't know the cost between now and 2050. That's, irre that's irreducible uncertainty. But what we do know is humans are going to continue to be stubbornly diurnal creatures. They're going to demand power hours after peak sunlight. And they're also going to be stubbornly seasonal as well. So if we want to do this all with renewable energy, this just takes fourth grade science to look at. The peak solar supply happens in mid-June, and the peak electricity demand happens in late August. And then, oh, by the way, peak wind supply is opposite of demand. So, and that's, and that's based on the difference in temperatures between the poles and the equator. So, you know, there's going to be an imbalance seasonal. And here's a graph of that imbalance. And by the way, this uh, data is only on ERCOT. I don't know to what extent this extends to other regions, but I assume there's seasonality all over the planet to some extent. So, on the right axis, I'm showing you the average demand, and these are the months. And on the left axis here, I'm showing you the capacity factor. So as you can see, we have a huge void here in late August. And then we, have, we would have an oversupply if we combine these sources. And so that's exactly what I've done. On the right axis is the average demand and supply by month. And the dotted line is the utilization maximizing combination of <coughs> solar energy to be 80% of load. And so as you can see, there's a persistent oversupply period in the spring and a persistent undersupply period in late summer. So as a result, there's low utilization of renewable energy in the spring, and we have to build a lot of capacity just to meet that demand in the late summer. And so here are four example days from March and August if we zoom in on that oversupply and undersupply episode. And as you can see, it happens for days on end. So let me just, I'm going to challenge the audience here. Uh, can any of you think of anything? Any appliance that you could shift four days later you know, due to expensive prices, that wouldn't hinder you very much. Can you think of one appliance you could, just maybe a couple days even? I started out by asking people seasonally, could you do this? I haven't got an answer yet. <laughs> so that's why I didn't include demand response. Second reason is it's almost impossible to model due to lack of data. And so as a proxy, what I've done is I've modeled storage. Storage is, you know, it's similar to demand response, right? If you have a hot water heater, that's essentially what you're using as your storage tool. And so you know, to model storage, you know, costs are very uncertain. So I just assume we had an act of God, and Elon Musk decided that he would give everybody in my study area a free power wall for every home in Texas. That's 8.75 million power walls. And so these oversupply and undersupply episodes would totally just dominate that battery. At 3 a.m. on the first day, this is a, this is a non-trivial battery, by the way, 25% of peak capacity and 60 gigawatt hours. That's a lot of storage. But on 3 a.m. on the first day, this storage is saturated. And on 4 a.m. on the first day in August, that storage is fully depleted. And so in order to get this here, you have to hold on to that electron for a long time. Basically, what I'm saying is batteries will take on a low utilization problem before they can solve the low utilization problem for renewables. OK, so how many batteries would be necessary per home? On the x-axis here, this is the amount of low carbon energy required. On the y-axis is the marginal utilization of low carbon energy. So that bottom blue line is utilization maximizing combination of storage. We had one power wall that improved the situation by 14%. The next power wall, only 12 The next power wall, 10 The last power wall, only 1%. So as you can see, there are diminishing returns. I'm not the first researcher to come up on this, but um, I, am the, I don't know of anybody else doing power wall analysis. So that green line up there, that's if we used all three sources and tried to maximize utilization. And as a result, we look at those same four days, and the, basically the utilization maximizing combination is dominated by dispatchable low carbon generation. You can see how beautifully this tucks in here. And you can see if we only use dispatchable low carbon, that would make this oversupply a little worse. So the solar actually helps the utilization of all the low carbon. So the reason that is is because wind and dispatchable low carbon generators oversupply at the same time, at night and during the winter. So they're in direct competition. So we know that we're going to have an interplay between the three technologies. And so what I've done here is I've modeled the utilization of the last dispatchable low carbon generator needed to reach 80% low carbon energy. 
And on the y-axis here, this is the starting renewable portfolio standard. And I've modeled four different renewable portfolio standards. One that's heavy in wind, and as you can see, if we reach the president's goal of 35% wind, that's going to create a low utilization problem for dispatchable low-carbon generators. So if dispatchable low-carbon generators are so expensive, how are they going to be any less expensive if they're only being utilized almost half the time? And this is what a lot of economic models are saying for modest decarbonization. Yes, so let's build wind. It has the lowest cost. And if we depend too much on solar, the same thing. Any kind of balance, you can see around 30 or 40 percent, that's when we start to have really have a low utilization problem for dispatchable low-carbon generators. So remember this number, 30 or 40 percent, that's where it shows up. But as you can see, there's still a timing problem because uh, we're not getting full utilization. So as I told you before, whether we're using renewables or not, storage has a use in deep decarbonization world, so I added storage. And as you can see, it increases utilization of these generators. And so that's another takeaway. There's no such thing as renewable energy storage. Eric Hittinger, my colleague, professor up at Rochester, he's written papers and I don't, it drives him crazy when he hears this term. There's no such thing as renewable energy storage. What storage does is increases utilization of low marginal cost generators. And as you can see, we still have a problem with low utilization with more renewables. And so in conclusion, uh, I've only been talking about utilization so far, so I did connect costs to all three, of types, all three types of generators, ran a dispatch model with 8760 data. That means hourly data, sorry about that. <laughs> so I did assume a value for reliability, and I did assume values for reliability with wind, solar, and DLC. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, um, when I was talking about uh, capacity markets not being mature, that's what CCUS does best. You could theoretically turn off the sequestration process and boost output theoretically up to 25%. So you know, if we're having an unpolar vortex, what would you prefer? Wind and solar generators that might be there or a, a team of dispatchable low carbon generators that can turn off the sequestration process and keep those lights on? You know, and, and I'm not exaggerating. Make sure no one dies in the vortex because they don't have heat. So on the x-axis here, is the mandate for low carbon energy. And on the y-axis here is the cost minimizing uh, penetration of those three different resources, wind, solar, and DLC. And as you can see, if we're only requiring modest decarbonization, 50 or 60% low carbon energy, this can be done ideally in a model with just wind and solar. But once we go towards deep decarbonization, the situation is totally flipped. Dispatchable low carbon generation should take up almost, you know, it should dominate the mix under deep decarbonization. And finally, with that free power wall, the results change slightly, but the conclusion stays the same. And you know, I've been talking about utilization all day today, so one last point here, solar is what's mostly helped by storage. That's because solar has diurnal cycles of oversupply and undersupply, so that battery can be utilized quite often, and so therefore storage helps solar more than helps wind, even though I assumed a higher cost for wind here. So here's my conclusion pictorially. We see, you know, we think that modest decarbonization with a carbon price is, is cost effective. And, 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 and basically, if you look at the modeling so far, using lower cost for wind and solar energy, you know, it's the easy path. And we think over that, over that path, we'll, we'll figure something out about the intermittency. We'll figure something out. Well, we might not. And there's, there's a sign missing here. It's a dead end. We probably, if we create a utilization problem for the dispatchable carbon generators, we probably will never build them. And so deep decarbonization is the tougher path, but it's far more likely when we get over that hill uh, that we can actually reach it. So the policy implications, cost-effective modest decarbonization, not the same thing as cost-effective deep decarbonization, moderate carbon price, uh, doesn't send adequate price signals to invest $10 billion in a first-of-a-kind plant. Instead, what's going to happen with that carbon price? It's going to create a low utilization problem for future uh, DLC generators. And policy intervention might be better. Uh, this is, this is uh, basically my policy idea. It's, it's, it's not brilliant. I wrote a paper on it. But basically, I wrote this. It was the final chapter of my thesis. And it was called the Low Carbon Capacity Standard. So if you would like me to send that to you, I'd be happy to. Uh, but basically, it's the idea that we should be mandating capacity directly, <coughs> knowing that we are uh, in a capacity we are, we're supply, we are rich in capacity right now, but we won't be in the future, and all these utilization arguments I just went over.